Johnny Gould's Jewish State. I was once upon a time a fanatic, Johnny. I would have never spoken to you seven years ago. I was an extremist Muslim. God opened my eyes, right? I want the freedom to speak because I'll tell you what, when I was an extremist, no one tried to shut me up. This is what I'm fascinated about in the West, Johnny. What does the Quran say about Jews? What does the Quran say about the land where the Jews should live? Amid the fog of Islamic extremism, is it possible to be a religious Muslim and be at peace with Jews and Israel? And when you're a Muslim fanatic in the Western world, why doesn't anyone stop you? Are you ready for a discussion on how some Muslims interpret the Quran? God tells me in the Holy Quran that he assigned this entire region, again, region, not land. So the borders of Israel today are not the region. They're part of the region. We're talking region. God tells me that he gave the Holy Land, Sinai, you name it, the Holy Land, the Jordan River, the whole of Jordan, all of that. He gave it to the children of Israel and he gave it to those whom he had a covenant with. And he said, enter the land and do not get out. Do not turn your backs on this land. Chapter five of the Holy Quran, verses 20 onwards. So this is a land title. God tells me he gave Moses and his people, the followers of the Torah, a land title to the Holy Land. We are gonna debate politically whether or not this land belongs to the Jews or belongs to the Palestinians. But I know the Holy Quran is the most superior text on, on planet Earth. There is no uh, Belfort Declaration, treaties, Oslo Accords, Abraham Accords, whatever you want to call it. All of this come later. The Quran tells me God wants this land to belong to the Jews and he wants Mecca to belong to the Muslims uh, led by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. So I now have two options, either go with God or go with the politicians. I can't go with the politicians. I have to go with God. I have to, there's no other way. So people will say, oh, that's Zionism. It's, not Zionism. it's me being a Muslim, me being a Muslim. As Jewish people, we have an ear to allies and friends from the Muslim and Arab world. And today my guest has an extraordinary outreach in the world. He has over 800,000 followers on Twitter. His message of peace is unequivocal. His name is Imam Muhammad Tohidi, also known as the Imam of Peace. And his solution for peace comes from religion, not secularity, from identity and faith together. Recognize those tenets? And dear listener, Johnny Gould's Jewish State racks up a first ever number one in the Apple Podcast News Commentary Charts. And it's been coming, but not in Israel, nor the USA, not even here in the UK. No, in Kuwait. And we peaked at number three in Qatar in the same week. Gulf States not part of the Abraham Accords. Ponder that. I'm so heartened and know that by listening yourself, you are part of a podcast community pursuing peace and understanding across borders. This was my first ever study of the Quran, and this may well be yours too. Listen up, because peace has to be out there somewhere. Let's look for it together. It's a warm welcome to the Vice President of the Global Imams Council. It's Imam Mohammed Tawhidi. Sir, a warm welcome to Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Johnny, thank you very, very much for having me. Peace be upon you and to your audience. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure for, for all of us. And it's a conversation that uh, we've wanted to put together for a very long time. 
You're also known as the Imam of Peace. You have a massive following around the world. Over 800,000 people are plugged into your worldview on Twitter. Imam, how has this come about? I think that uh, it's not me that's important. It's the truth that's important. And anyone who speaks the truth will find himself amongst a large community. And I say large because the people who follow the truth are always the majority, in my view. Uh, and uh, they will welcome uh, the truth. And uh, there's nothing better than advocating for peace. And, and the very fact that I see this response uh, motivates me to continue advocating for peace between people of all faiths and all backgrounds. Which is a, a wonderful sentiment. I think we all will applaud that. Can we start with your most recent tweet since we set the tape rolling, which rather sums up your belief system, which concerns the state of Israel. Denying Jewish existence in the Holy Land before 1948 is an attack not only on Judaism, but all Abrahamic faiths. Jewish prophets and their nations preserved monotheism and the message of God. Interestingly enough, you spell God like we do in Judaism, G-D. These are the roots and pillars of our religions and denying them is absolute insanity. And even by your own standards, um, that doesn't go as far. You talk about how the Holy Land Israel belongs to the Jewish people just as Medina belongs uh, to the Arabian people. Indeed, indeed. Uh, firstly, to clarify why I make this tweet or these series of tweets, uh, I'm a religious man. I'm not just a Muslim, I'm a religious Orthodox practicing Muslim, and I'm very proud of my faith and my religion. And when I see that my religion is being attacked indirectly, uh, it really becomes an obligation for me to uh, defend my religion. And the Jewish prophets are also prophets in Islam. Moses, David, Solomon, Abraham, you name it. All of the prophets of the Bani Israel, the Israelites, are prophets in Islam too. If we reject one of them, then we can't be Muslim. Now, those prophets had nations and they had people and they had followers who believed in them. They were the believers of their time. They preserved monotheism. And that is why Islam, a very uh, late and young religion compared to Christianity, uh, is able to adhere to monotheism and, and pray to the one true God because of the preservation that Judaism uh, actually uh, had throughout its history, preserving monotheism, protecting it. Whenever I see a fundamentalist, Islamist, extremist attacking Jewish history in the Holy Land because they want to say, oh, uh, the Palestinians were there first and the Jews came from Europe. What he's actually doing is he's trying to erase or they are trying to erase the history of God's prophets in that land and therefore shooting Islam, not only in the foot, but in the head to erase the history of Judaism from that region, from the Holy Land, is literally destroying a pillar upon which Islam uh, stands on and depends on. And that is monotheism and the Jewish prophets that we believe our prophet is a continuation. His prophecy is a continuation. His prophethood uh, is based on the very belief in the one true God that they uh, came with. So whenever I am tweeting in this manner, I'm actually defending my religion. It appears to many to be, oh, this is a Zionist imam. He's a pro-Israel imam. It's really not that. What's happening is this. I'm a Muslim. And when I see Judaism being attacked in this way, in this fundamentalist, Islamist, dishonest way, I step forward and I say, listen, you may have a political problem with the Jews, but to say this land doesn't belong to them, you're basically saying it doesn't belong to Moses and it doesn't belong to Solomon, and it doesn't belong to David. So then where does that leave us as Muslims? It leaves us floating in the air. Where do we go? Where, where are our roots now if you're going to erase them? Here is where we and you cross Parts. This is our meeting point where my belief system depends on your existence. And when the Islamist tries to erase your existence, I have to step in in order to defend your existence because not only does it impact me, it impacts all Abrahamic faiths. And it, it, is, it is a declaration of war against God, in my opinion, to try and erase the history of the prophets that he sent. 
Imam, such a, a beautiful sentiment and so logical and, and, and so many things to unpack there. The tension between the secular and religious. You might put the Palestinians in a secular notion. And indeed, we might also talk about uh, the relationship between Zionism and Islam, because if I understand it there, you know, would you call yourself a Zionist or as a Muslim who is pro-Israel, um, is that not possible? Can someone who is a Muslim who is pro-Israel not be a Zionist? I wouldn't classify uh, Palestinians in any Islamic box because their cause is not Islamic to begin with. So the Palestinian cause is not a Islamic cause. They will point to Al-Aqsa Mosque, but there is no evidence that the Aqsa Mosque is actually in Jerusalem. The verse in the Holy Quran that was revealed during the life of the Holy Prophet, right, uh, speaks about a mosque that existed during the life of the prophets. The mosque in Jerusalem today was established in the year 705, right, 73 years after the death of the Holy Prophet. So there was no more Quranic revelation of verses after the death of the Prophet. The verse in the Quran couldn't have been speaking about a mosque that does not exist. So this mosque in Jerusalem is heavily debated within Islam itself. Now, because of the word, the farthest mosque, Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is translated to the farthest mosque, there are many interpretations. One is that the mosque is actually in the heavens. We believe there's a mosque in the heavens called Al-Aqsa Mosque. The same way we believe above the Kaaba, the black cube in Mecca, there's another mosque in the heavens called Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur. We believe in that. And again, because of the, the name, we believe there is a mosque that still exists today in the, in the city of Al-Ju'arana, north from Mecca, around 29 kilometers in Saudi Arabia today. That is called the farthest mosque. And then from that mosque uh, towards Mecca, there's a mosque called the nearer mosque. Al-Adna, the nearer, Al-Aqsa, the farther. Two mosques. So there's a heavy debate even between the Sunnis and the Shia Muslims, majority, minorities, as to where this mosque is, simply because the one in uh, Jerusalem was built by the Umayyad dynasty, and they came much later in, in Islamic caliphates. So there was the first caliph, the second caliph, the third caliph, the fourth caliph, then the fifth of the fifth caliphs built that mosque. The Prophet did not pray in it, didn't visit it. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, until his last day, he was at war with the region of Jerusalem because it was ruled by the Romans, the Byzantines. And before the prophet died, the, the last thing he did was he sent an army led by a, a young man called Osama bin Zayd. And the army, while the prophet was on his deathbed, he sent the army to go and fight the Romans to avenge Zayd, the, uh, the father of Osama, because he promised he was going to do that. So until his last day, he was at war with that region. The first caliph did not go to uh, Jerusalem. It was the second caliph, Umar ibn Khattab, who had to put Jerusalem under siege to take it. So if it was a Muslim city, why would he need to put it under siege and besiege the Muslims, right? Then when he wanted to pray, he was inside a church and he said, I will not pray inside the church because I don't want Muslims to start this custom of praying inside churches. So he prayed outside. If a mosque did exist, he would have prayed in the mosque. Why pray outside the church? So and there are many, uh, you know, th these are historical facts that indicate that mosque in Jerusalem cannot be the Aqsa that's mentioned in the Quran. Uh, it's a different mosque. So uh, the cause is not Islamic because, again, uh, this is not the Aqsa mosque. And even if there's a claim, it's not well established within Islamic scripture. So it's controversial. The cause cannot be Islamic because in order to, to have an Islamic cause, you need to be uh, operating within Islamic law, right? In conflict, we have Islamic law. The current way Hamas operates is a direct violation of Islamic laws of war, of conflict, of, on how to treat the enemy, right? You can't destroy a tree. You can't harm an animal. Look at how Hamas uh, burns farms. Th these are basics within Islamic laws of conflict that you cannot do. All of Islam's laws on conflict uh, are defensive. They can never be offensive. And the way they have maintained their conflict is by saying, well, uh, Israel started in 1948. It's been defensive ever since. 
right? That's their perverted understanding. Islam deals with conflict by conflict basis. It doesn't say, oh, because you hit me 70 years ago that I'm going to be defending myself. Whatever I do to you will be a form of defense because you started 70 years ago. Islam has a rational approach to its jurisprudence, right? Uh, so the cause is not Islamic and they are not Arabs either. So the Palestinians are not Arabs and their cause is not Islamic. It's not an Arabic cause. I'm not a traitor for not joining you in your cause because I'm a Muslim. Your cause is not Islamic. I'm an Arab. Your cause is not Arabic. So what do you want me to do? And indeed, uh, the Palestinians are also Christian as well. Um, yes. Less and less each year, unfortunately, tragically. But let me just ask the second part of that, which is about uh, Zionism. Would you call yourself a Zionist? Is a Muslim who is pro-Israel always a Zionist? Or is there a, another subsection of supporting the Jewish people in their ancestral homeland without you having to be a Zionist, because again, people might argue, obviously within the Jewish faith as well, that, that Zionism is a political entity, not entirely a religious one. Um, other people there would say that it goes back to the fourth um, parsha of, of our Torah, Lech Lecha, to return to the land of Israel. So, you know, there is a tension again between, if you like, 19th century European Zionism and Torah um, uh, aspects of, of, of the land of Israel. So I'm not a politician. <laughs> and, uh, a Muslim uh, accepts no other uh, labels other than Muslim. I'm a Muslim. People can call me Zionist. People can call me Mossad. People call me whatever they like. That is their right to describe me with what they uh, like. That's fine. Uh, but I am a Muslim. And I apply to myself uh, my Islamic laws and what I believe God wants, right? God tells me in the Holy Quran that he assigned this entire region, again, region, not land. So the borders of Israel today are not the region. They're part of the region. We're talking region. God tells me that he gave the Holy Land. Sinai, you name it, the Holy Land, the Jordan River, the whole of Jordan, all of that. He gave it to the children of Israel. He gave it to the prophets of Israel and he gave it to their nations and he gave it to those whom he had a covenant with. And he said, I assigned it to you, enter the land and do not get out. Do not turn your backs on this land. Chapter 5 of the Holy Quran, verses 20 onwards. So, this is a land title. God tells me he gave Moses and his people, the followers of the Torah, a land title to the Holy Land. So I look at it this way. Fine. We are going to debate politically whether or not this land belongs to the Jews or belongs to the Palestinians. But I know the Holy Quran is the most superior text on, on planet Earth. There is no a Belfort Declaration, there is no uh, court ruling, Supreme Court, opinion, treaties, Oslo Accords, Abraham Accords, whatever you want to call it. All of this come later. The Quran tells me God wants this land to belong to the Jews and he wants Mecca to belong to the Muslims uh, led by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. So I now have two options, either go with God or go with the politicians. I can't go with the politicians. I have to go with God. I have to. There's no other way. So people will say, oh, that's Zionism. It's not Zionism. It's me being a Muslim. Me being a Muslim. If God tells me to take the land from the Jews, I'll say, okay, I'll do it. But now God tells me the land belongs to the Jews. End of story. God, the thing, here's the thing, Johnny. Islam is at war ideologically with idol worshippers. That is the main claim of Islam. When it emerged in Arabia, right, the same way Abraham destroyed the idols and went to war against Nimrod, Namrud, right, and then Namrud tried to assassinate him and you know, the whole issue of the catapult and throw him into the fire. It's an Abrahamic religion. The prophet too went to war against idol worshippers, those who would desecrate the holy uh, mosque with idols. So Islam's problem is with idol worshipping. It's not really with Judaism. Islam never went to war against Judaism. There is no framework in Islam to fight Jews because they are Jews. 
All the conflicts that happen, happen because of tribal uh, issues. Today, however, they try to present a different uh, form of Islam. It's not you know, founded within Islamic law for Muslims to find Jews. In fact, we are so close. I don't believe it. Johnny, look, today the Christians are allied with the uh, Palestinian militias, meaning Europe and so on. Whereas they are so far apart ideologically, it's hypocrisy to call yourself a Muslim and shake hands with someone who believes that God had a son, right? And that the son was crucified. These, the, this is called disbelief kufr in Islam, right? It's called kufr in Islam for you to shake their hands. The reason why I have interfaith with Christians, right, is because they know very well that I do not accept the Trinity. And they, they're okay with that. And they don't accept my prophet either. They, they don't think I'm going to be saved, but that's fine, right? You go your way, I go my way. My work is peace. I don't sell my principles and sell my religion when I'm dealing with the Christians. But when I'm dealing with the Jews, I don't have to worry about this. Your God is the same God as me. There's no, there's no uh, Trinity and God deals with Mary and uh, none of that. None of that. <laughs> one of the, so one you of the and I are on, are on the same page. Indeed, one of the tensions that I hear from my Rabbonim is this tension between there being only one God and there being a holy trinity, three gods, or a, a God of three portions. However, I mean, you are a Muslim full stop, not a, uh, a Muslim of any other kind, but a Muslim. However, you do espouse uh, liberal values, which I see uh, on your Twitter feed and in videos and other discussions than, and articles that you've had. And like my good friend Ed Hussein, you don't see any conflict with liberal values while still being a fully practicing Muslim. Imam, despite calling yourself just a Muslim, you are also to a certain extent uh, a libertarian, a liberal in, in, in secular terms. I understand why you would think that. So here's, let me just give you one example. Okay, Let, let's discuss this, uh, secularism, just as an example. So you believe in the separation of uh, church uh, and state, religion and state, correct? Yes. I'm assuming you do. Okay, because I haven't asked you that before. Why do you believe so? Well, it helps um, the Jewish communities and the diasporas uh, from persecution, or at least it was a form of insurance which sort of came about from 1870 onwards. It didn't always work as we've seen, but uh, you know, the, the place where these Western values of separation between church and state exist have been beneficent to Jewish communities around the world. Perfect. So as someone who is secular would make that argument. I believe in the separation of mosque and state to protect the mosque from the filth of politics. <laughs> so we cross paths when it comes here, I'm not a secular because I would like to advocate for democracy, right? I believe that the laws of my God are perfect. And I don't believe they include beheading and butchering and stoning, uh, you know, the, these, uh, you know, corrupt things that have been inserted into my religion. I do not approve of religion in government to protect the religion from the government. So you see where we cross, cross yeah. paths. This, when I come out and I, without this explanation, of course, and I say, we should separate mosque and state, or immediately liberal, secular. But what they do not see is that I'm actually a orthodox Muslim defending my religion from the corruption that comes with politics. This is where you and I right, cross paths. We have common, common uh, uh, objectives, common understandings, but our reasoning is slightly different. You I, want to protect your people, I want to protect not only my people, but my religion, because religion is very easy to corrupt. I must tell you, Imam, I think I'm probably a bit closer to you than, than might have first imagined, because I also like the idea of my Judaism as a bulwark against the excesses, if you like, of the secular world, because we are constantly delivered into a parade of secular values, uh, progressive values, woke values, which frequently contradict and suppress religious people, be they Christian, Muslim, Jewish or other. And 
I send my children to a Jewish school as a form of defense against the excesses of secularism, which has increased across the Western world over the last 20 or 30 years. So um, having said what I said before, as the theory of the separation being church and state being a, a jolly good thing, I have ended up perhaps a little bit like you in older age, while I try to bring up kids in the Jewish faith to give them an alternative narrative as a defense, as a bulwark uh, against the excesses of secular life and for them to engage fully with their heritage, perhaps, you know, God willing, even more than I do. So I think we are kindred spirits in that. And and on the subject of uh, freedom and identity, Imam, um, let's unpack furthermore, because you're saying so many interesting, fascinating things. Uh, I am heartened by the logic by which you approach your Islam. I think our audience will be as well. What's more important, freedom or identity? What is the best way, the ideal way to practice both? Okay, freedom is more important than identity. Without freedom, you cannot have an identity. Uh, so freedom definitely is the way forward. But I believe that in the world we live in, especially the West, the West is uh, somewhat broken uh, currently. Uh, this is not the West that we migrated to uh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's a bit, it's a bit sad to see it decline. Whereas you look at the Middle East and they're prospering. And but in any case. Uh, to be able to uh, practice your freedom and your identity, you need to understand what your objectives are in life, right? If uh, someone believes that they should, let me say this very clearly, if someone believes they should basically copy other people and submit to whatever narrative there is and support the current thing, right? Then they shouldn't have been born. You know, what difference does your existence and non-existence make? If you are just going to be part of an echo chamber with no character, no personality, no principles, nothing to stand for, right? Uh, living in a world, you know, how long are you going to live for? 50, 60, 70 years, average human life, fine. What a shame it is to waste these years by standing for uh, everything that other people want to stand for, except what you truly believe. It's not worth it. I mean, what's worst case scenario? Oh, they'll probably criticize you with a few articles. They'll cancel an event. And who cares? At the end of the day, you are going to live a genuine life. You can look yourself in the mirror and say, I am not a puppet, right? That is what I consider freedom. When I can say what I want to say today, uh, well, after I ran in the election for the Global Imams Council, uh, and, and again, I speak on a personal level, they met with me and they said, Imam, your views, your opinions, what are we going to do, the council, safety, many other issues. I said, listen, I'm not going to change a single opinion. Not one. All of my opinions, whether you like them or not, I'm not going to denounce myself and my story and my history. Accept me for who I am. That is my freedom. Because freedom also means defending who you are and defending your past. That's exactly it. I was once upon a time a fanatic, Johnny. I would have never spoken to you seven years ago. I was an extremist Muslim. God opened my eyes, right? I want the freedom to speak because I'll tell you what, when I was an extremist, no one tried to shut me up. This is what I'm fascinated about in the West, Johnny. When I was an Islamist extremist on the pulpits in Australia, going around, I don't know if you've seen my, my videos of Younger Me. Have you seen Younger Me? Yes, when I, I have. I wanted to talk about that in just a moment. Right? Uh, no one ever came to me and said, hey, what are you doing? Not a single media article attacked me when I was calling for the destruction of the Jews and the Jewish state. Not one. But the moment I say, let's become men of peace and let's change it, then, oh, no, no, no. You can't be a real Muslim. huh? What do you mean not oppressed? What do you mean not a victim? You have to be a victim. You're a brand man in, in the West. You have to be a victim, <laughs> right? So uh, we're dealing with, with this uh, struggle in the West that someone like me has to basically observe and you know be patient with it. So let's try and uh, use slightly more appropriate metaphors than a Damascene conversion or indeed an epiphany. But you had a version of both, sir. What took you? like Majid Nawaz, like Ed Hussein, to this new place of 
enlightenment. There's another perhaps inappropriate uh, phrase, but what took you to this new place? Okay, um, so I wrote a book about my, my story and published in 2018, it's a bestseller. It's called The Tragedy of Islam, uh, Admissions of a Muslim Imam. The tragedy is the extremists. Uh, so if, if Islam was a person, its tragedy would be the Islamists and the extremists. So for those listening, do not buy my book. Uh, you'll find the link on my website soon where you can download it for free. Uh, now, let me answer your question. It's a long and lonely process, Johnny. A long and lonely process. My opinion was not something I got from Netflix or YouTube or lecture. It's something I grew up with. I was taught by people I loved and respected and revered. And, and it was part of my religious identity, right? So... Uh, long story short, I had certain interactions with Jews throughout the years, and this began. So the Imam Tawheed you see today, uh, this whole thing began 2016, 2017. So I'm basically five years, six years into uh, the new me, and I'm still learning and I'm still developing. So I asked the world to give me a bit of patience. Um, so it was my car, my vehicle that broke down on the Hume Highway from Melbourne to, towards Shepparton. And a Jewish man came and helped me. Uh, and uh, basically, that showed me that these people are not inherently evil. There could be some good from them. Uh, furthermore, when my uncle Faris was burnt alive and killed by ISIS, uh, and I came out speaking against the Islamic extremists in Australia, the only, the only community that sided with me was the Australian Jewish Association. Everyone else called me sectarian. Everyone else called me extremist. Everyone else said, you're blaming all Muslims. And they would not want to see that I'm a victim, right? And I come from a family of victims of ISIS terrorism. The only group that sided with me was because of the experience they have with Islamic extremism was the Australian Jewish Association. Then they invited me over to a gala. I met rabbis, then came Chabad, right? Chabad rabbis. And then I traveled uh, the world and I met a rabbi let me say this to you. I met a rabbi who entered my heart. Every other rabbi before that, it would be interfaith, ideological discussions, right? This very rabbi became my brother. He's an elder brother to me. And that is Rabbi Eli Abadi. He's now the senior rabbi uh, in the Jewish Council of the Emirates in the UAE. Uh, and he's uh, from New York. Uh, a very honorable, revered man a medical doctor as well. This man entered my heart, the first Jewish rabbi to really uh, secure a place uh, in my heart because of how genuine he is, how welcoming he was, and how uh, well uh, carried he was and how he structured his, uh, uh, his conversation, his sentences with me. And uh, he changed the entire vision that I had. Uh, about Jews and Judaism entirely. So he turned me from someone who tolerated Jews to someone who loved Jews, to someone who wanted every good for them, to someone who would oppose those who would call for their annihilation. And then slowly you see this activism that I have alongside my professional life is that I have to uh, oppose extremist voices in order that they do not operate without criticism. Because Rabbi Abadi met me in 2018, 2019. This was two years into my development into who I am today. So I still had a lot of questions, still wanted to uh, see uh, and feel the Jewish community uh, firsthand. And, and now this was going global. Now we're dealing outside Australia. Uh, and I had never met Jews in my life outside what I described for you. Uh, and of course he speaks Arabic too, so that helped a lot. Right? Uh, when you speak someone's language, you're speaking to their hearts, not only their, 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 their brain. Uh, so uh, he, he gets a lot of credit for the peace work and the good that comes uh, from, from my work. Imam uh, Mabruk and Kol Hakavod, there's two languages. I'm doing my very best. Um, what, <laughs> what is your message to the extremists that you left behind? So your co-religionists who still, in a way, eat themselves up with this uh, zeal of, of hate and division. Okay, 
So the thing is, Brother Johnny, an extremist doesn't know he's an extremist. That's the thing. <laughs> so when you're trying to give them advice, they don't think there's anything wrong with them to begin with. So to try and give them advice to begin with, they would wonder, why is he giving me advice? What's wrong with me? Right. So they don't know they're extremists. I believe the key, the key to everything is to read and study outside your own life. A Muslim scholar has to be aware of everything that is around them, to educate themselves in everything, not just religion, but astronomy, mathematics, physics, you name it. Our earliest scholars, Abyssina, and you name them, they were giants in medicine, in, in chemistry, even, even nuclear uh, power. We have writings in early Islamic scripture, Jabal bin Hayyan, uh, you know, th these are giants. So today, the very idea that we should only read from within our school of thought, we should only read books published by Muslim scholars, this not only creates an echo chamber, this deprives you of general, literal knowledge because you're only repeating what your teacher has taught you. There's nothing new. When you open up your mind, and you embrace knowledge for knowledge, for the sake of knowledge, not because politics or uh, influence or celebrity. No, 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 no. Just for the sake of knowledge. What are these Jews saying? What is this person? What is Rabbi Sachs saying? You don't have to agree with him. I just want to know what is he saying? Perhaps I can respond to him. And if you fail, maybe he's right. Right? So the thing is, always side with the truth, even if it goes against your interests. Because if the truth, if, if the truth makes you stop, if you stop and you say, hang on, I know this is the truth, but it doesn't fit with my interests, then perhaps you are on the wrong side of history. Perhaps you need to change, okay? Um, and again, every person is different, but I believe the key to all of this is knowledge and understanding. Knowledge and understanding. Today, whenever I get questioned about my positions and why I believe this, I don't use any Jewish book. I don't, use, I don't point to the Torah. I bring the Quran. I bring my scripture. Here, I'm a Muslim. Here's what I believe in the Quran. How am I a hypocrite? I'm not. They cannot use the Quran to prove me wrong. So again, books of authority. The Quran is my book of authority. They will have theirs. But raising uh, awareness and knowledge, seeking knowledge for the sake of knowledge is the cure for extremism. That sounds wonderful. The, the idea of uh, truth uh, enveloping all ideologies, that there is a, an essential truth, whatever your birth, wherever you're from, whatever your religion, may have been the kernel which unlocked the door to normalization between Israel and the Gulf states with Sudan and, please God, very soon Indonesia, which would be an amazing achievement as the world's biggest Muslim nation. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, a previous guest on Johnny Gould's Jewish State was Jason Greenblatt, who himself is uh, Orthodox Jewish. And he, alongside uh, Jared Kushner and Ambassador David Friedman, three Jewish people and Orthodox to boot, went to the Arab world, be they um, Palestinian or Egyptian or even the Gulf, and found four peaceful countries and god willing some more as well and jason said that rather than being an orthodox jew standing in the way of an essential truth and a peace it actually helped in a region where religion is important since you touched on religion i, I do want to sort of uh, also push back on a question that i often get which is how is it that a religious man, or in the case of Jared and David as well, three Orthodox Jews were the right choice for this? And I would argue it's quite the opposite. Religion is so important in this region um, that my being a religious person has only enhanced the conversations and the respect that we showed one another. What I have to put to fill in on phylacteries in any particular Arab country um, I was only shown tremendous respect for them to find me a place, a private place to pray. My kosher dietary requirements also were always adhered to, including, by the way, with the Palestinian Authority. In one of my first meetings with them, perhaps it was my first meeting, we had a massive lunch prepared. Uh, their food looked excellent, but they went out of their way to make sure that I was properly fed. Um, 
I understand when they have to go pray as well. Like there's a an unspoken understanding between me and them about how religion and family for that matter, what that all means to us and why it's important to solve this conflict. So um, I feel blessed that I had the opportunity. I think my being a religious person uh, was not a negative. I would argue it was a positive. That doesn't mean that those who aren't religious can't uh, also play a, a significant role or even perhaps solve the conflict. But I uh, would say that it was not a negative whatsoever. And this strikes to the chord that you just talked about, about there being a truth among people of religion. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And speaking about the Abraham Accords, I mean, you'll have many people that come and say, uh, these are all political alliances and politics is dirty, therefore you can, uh, you know, shake hands with the Jews and, and they'll, they'll talk like this. But the reality is, the reality is uh, very clearly, the Muslim world is governed by Muslim leaders. We're not talking, uh, you know, uh, in the West. This is, uh, you know, the land of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. This is Arabia. Islam does not recognize borders. This is, these are regions. These are Arab tribes. These are followers of the Prophet Muhammad, right? Saudi Arabia embraces Mecca and Dina. Uh, these are the custodians of the Holy Two Shrines in Islam. Uh, the, the most important sites in Islam. You're dealing with uh, faithful Muslim rulers and they believe there is absolutely no clash whatsoever to live side by side with the Jews and to embrace them and hug them and protect them and afford them the same rights they afford all other citizens. Any extremist, any extremist who comes out and says that the uh, Abraham Accords are political and that they are anti-Islam, is actually insulting all these Muslims who pray five times a day, who will fast in Ramadan, who memorize the Holy Quran, who perform their Hajj rituals, who, pay, who, who live a Muslim life. They are Muslim. They're not Muslim converts. They are Muslims who have been Muslims since the uh, birth of Islam, since the emergence of the religion in Arabia. They fought for Islam. They have ancestors who lost their eyes and limbs for Islam. These are who are normalizing relations today. They're children. They're children, my brother. So we're not people who came out of nowhere and said, hey, let's shake hands with the Jews. No, 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 no. No, this is our region. This is our religion. And it does not tell me that shaking the hand of the, of the follower of Moses is anti my God, is something my God would be upset with. That does not exist. The Abraham Accords, is legitimate religiously as well, because this is what God calls for in the Holy Quran, peace and harmony between all people. If you have not declared war against me, okay, you, Johnny, you have not declared war against me. Why should I fight you? Why should I do it? Why? What is the reason? Islam does not tell me to go and fight you. Listening to such a principled and faith-based reason for the Abraham Accords to have succeeded and come about, Perhaps Doré Gold, architect of the peace deal with Jordan in 1994, shouldn't be too surprised at the durability and success of the Abraham Accords. I have been positively surprised at the durability of the Abraham Accords, that they didn't just dissipate uh, with the departure of the American president, Mr. Trump, and the Israeli prime minister, uh, Mr. Netanyahu. The uh, Arab leaders themselves had their own reasons for preserving these relationships. So the very scam that we've been living for over seven decades, right, that the Jews are out there to expand and to destroy us and to wipe the region and to conquer our land and this and that, where? We didn't see anything like that happen. Where? The Jews said, we don't want your Mecca, and we don't want your Medina, and we don't want your Saudi Arabia, and we don't even want Arabia. We want Judea. We are indigenous to Judea. God gave it to us. It's in your book, and I acknowledge it's in my book. End of story. You live on this side of the Jordan River. We live on this side of the Jordan River. And God bless both of us. What's the problem? This cancerous community, okay, that came out of nowhere, we don't know them. They call themselves the Palestinians. We don't know them, John. 
Where did they come from? We don't know that. They descend from the Romans. They descend from the Circassians. They descend from the Gypsies. They descend from the Turks, from the Armenians, from Greece, from uh, you name it, from the Persians, uh, the Ottoman, and who came with them, the Tartar. Okay, we don't know these people. They are not Arabs. The real Arabs who live in the West Bank and Gaza, they're indigenous to Arabia. They're indigenous to Arabia, Johnny. They're not indigenous to Israel. So they have no claim here in, 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 uh, you know, on this side of, of the world. So what I'm saying is this. There is no real obstacle between Muslims and Jews. The obstacle that is the Palestinian cause, that's a problem of land. land. And every country has a group of people who dispute land borders. This is yours. This is mine. And it can be solved between them. Yes, our previous uh, leaders, may God forgive them, uh, they saw that the Palestinians uh, should be supported, right? Tension, agendas, I don't know. But a certain level of anti-Semitism was clearly involved in it, right? So if, let's say, the state of Israel today was ruled by, uh, what's his name? Jeremy Corbyn. Okay. Do you think Hamas would be firing rockets at Jeremy Corbyn? It would never happen. Never happened. If Israel was a communist state, uh, like one that's run by uh, Fidel Castro or the Venezuelan regime or like Cuba, would there be conflict for seven decades? No. The real issue, the real issue is that these people, the Palestinians, do not want Jewish neighbors. End of story. That's the whole issue. And the region believed that if Israel was created, it was going to expand. And therefore, they pumped and pumped and pumped money, 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 money to the Palestinian cause. And then at the end of the day, the Palestinians stabbed the Arabs in the back and went and shook hands with the Iranian regime, with Qatar uh, and Turkey. So where, are we, where, where do we go? Where do we go? Do we, do we establish civilizations? Do we need the approval of the Palestinians? We don't need that. We don't need their approval. They depended on us. Now we say, my brother, you and I have no problem. You want to live in peace? I want to live in peace. I'll shake your hand. We shake my hand. God bless both of us. Right? Let's live in peace. This really should not need treaties. This should not need UN resolutions. It shouldn't be a problem. Accords, Abraham, yeah, fine. But do we, as humans, do I really need uh, to have or all of these arrangements, just so you and I can embrace each other and live in peace, it's sad. And it also shows you the, the seriousness of, of the, the problem and the distraction away from peace. So to clarify, I would like to see Palestinians have their own state. I really do. But they already have three states. They have Gaza with a government, economy, military. They have the West Bank with a government, military, economy. And they have Jordan, where 92 to 93% of the Arab-speaking population are Palestinian. So what more do you want? They try to take Kuwait. You know, when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, the Palestinians fought alongside Saddam Hussein to invade Kuwait. After the liberation, the Western liberation of Kuwait, Kuwait expelled 400,000 Palestinians. Search it, the Palestinian exodus of Kuwait. They went to Lebanon, they started the civil war. They tried to assassinate several Muslim leaders. Yasser Arafat got um, Ahmad Gaddafi to assassinate uh, Musa Sadr, the leader of the Amal movement in uh, Lebanon. So you're talking about people who have really backstabbed us. Really, they did. And now they're siding with the Iranian regime, uh, with the Houthis. So my brother, uh, the people who are killing Jews betrayed us and they sucked us dry. They took our money, our time, everything. And we, our generation now, in the UAE, in Saudi Arabia, we're not perfect, but we are aware we're a new generation of young men and women who want to live in peace. We appreciate technology, we appreciate education, we appreciate science, right? And we consider the Palestinian cause to be a complete distraction from the reality of life, from the reality of life. So that's why when we say Abraham Accords, it's not based on politics, it's based on much more. We want peace, end of story. The heartache for the Islamic world, Imam, is this fight between, shall we say, those of a Palestinian sensibility and the politics of 
Islamism and pure Islam uh, as it was intended to be practiced. We are fighting, aren't we, in your religion for the soul of Islam, but the arc of, uh, of morality is always bent to justice. When will this battle of ideas within Islam come about? And would you call it a form of reformation which is, which is, which is yet to come? A reformation is a delusion. Okay. Reformation in Islam is a delusion, at least in Islam. I don't believe in it. I believe in social reform. So look at the UAE. They're one of the best countries in the West. The West would love to, everyone in the West would love to honeymoon and visit the, the UAE and live there, right? It's a Muslim country, Muslim rulers, mosques, Muslim citizens, Muslim majority. Did they change the Quran? No. Do they, are they at war with the West or the Jews or Israel? No. Did they change the scripture? No. What do they do? Society, awareness, the, the level of awareness in society rose. There's a social reformation. The same with Bahrain, the same with Oman, right? And the reality is we need social reformation. Let me tell you why religious reform is a delusion. Muslims will only accept what is from God. A reformed version of the Quran is not from God. I cannot accept it. It has to be from God. Anything man-made cannot be, cannot be called religion. It can be called theory. You call it a theory, but you can't call it religion. That's why reformers uh, will never really find... Uh, I mean, look at their events. Three, four people, maximum 50 people sitting down and, you know... Like clubs, uh, you can't change a religion like Islam. Islam is, is very diverse. We don't have a hierarchy. Look at the Christian church, for example, the Catholic church. There's a hierarchy. There's a pope. He runs the show. In Islam, we don't have a pope. We have many popes, many schools of thought. Everyone publishes. Everyone teaches. Everyone issues law. Everyone, everyone derives uh, law from the Quran and interprets. Everyone, it's a very diverse and open religion. We're not an organized religion like Christianity. So to say reform, who, who gets to decide which verses get reformed? Who gets to decide uh, which school of thought should be reformed? There are over 73 schools of thought in Islam. Two denominations, over 70, 73 and more schools of thought in Islam. Who's going to decide all of them are going to be reformed? It doesn't work like that. It's not just a, 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 a catchy word that we throw around. Right, because how old are these reformers? 50, 60 years old? Okay, are they going to live to see a reform in Islam? No, so don't waste my time. Don't waste my time. Let's talk re reality. Society needs a reformation. Come, look at the UAE. The UAE is leading the way, literally, even before Saudi Arabia. UAE has put its foot down and said, Listen, our rockets will go to Mars for scientific research, they will not go on the Jews. We're not going to buy rockets on the Jews. I know different rockets, but you get the, the point, okay. So you have the UAE that took the Arabs to Mars and you have the Iranian regime that's, uh, uh, you know, sponsoring militias like an octopus in every country, bombing uh, the holiest sites in Islam. The Houthi is literally threw a rocket missile at Mecca and God protected Mecca. So the choice is very clear. It's very clear, my brother. Can I have a little bit about your personal story, Imam. Um, you're an Australian, or in the sense you're a Muslim, of course, as we've learned. Born in Iran, in the holy city of Qom. Okay? And I am born into a family of decades of history in the Islamic seminary. Uh, and uh, I was ordained by the Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sadiq Shirazi in 2010, in June 2010, publicly. Uh, I'm licensed by the Islamic seminary of Karbala, uh, along with many other licenses from Grand Ayatollahs, many of whom we, we have disagreements, but I don't represent them. I'm not their deputy, right? Every imam at one stage in Shia Islam had to have been ordained by a Grand Ayatollah. Mm -hmm. okay, you can't be an imam in Shia Islam who's not ordained. The same with the Sunni school of thought. You have to be ordained by an institute. Whether you still agree with that institute or not is a different story. Whether okay. you represent it or not, a different story. Before that, I was in media. So here's where my experience in social media comes from. I'm the co-founder of Imam Hussein TV3. Um, and I left it in 2014. It's one of the largest English-speaking Islamic channels uh, out there today. A very prominent channel. I left it in 2014. Uh, my background is media. Uh, not uh, by study. Not by study. 
but my line of work, uh, religion-wise, many imams, they, they like to have mosques and centers and institutes, and some of them go into uh, preaching through channels and, and the social media and so on. So we actually had uh, over 22 TV stations within the office of Ayatollah Shirazi. And I was part of the English section. Uh, and then from that came my work in uh, Australia. Uh, in 2016, I founded the Islamic Association of South Australia. Then I left then in 2019. Uh, after that came COVID and I went back to my studies. And uh, I'm currently doing a Doctor of Law degree uh, in Australia. Uh, I uh, uh, ran for the Global Imams Council during COVID, uh, during this pandemic as well, and I won. Uh, I have a vision. Uh, the thing is, my journey has just begun. This is the thing. I came out of an extremist lifestyle, and I'm only uh, four years in, and then COVID hits two years, I get slowed down. So I have a greater vision for how the council is going to play out in the West, uh, relations with Jews, Muslims in uh, the Gulf mainly, and then tackling the extremists who are more extreme in the West than in the Middle East. So in the Middle East, the Muslim Brotherhood are banned in the UAE, banned in Saudi Arabia. They're sitting in Congress in America. They're incorporated in the UK. The Hezbo Tahrir operates and raises money in the UK. We don't have that in the UAE. Uh, you have the, the extremists going to France. We don't have that the, you know, in, in Oman and in, in so on. So it's, it's very important that we understand that the vision uh, of, of Islam, especially the way the strategy that I follow, is that we need to be somewhat patient, be somewhat patient, move strategically, uh, alliances, bring Muslims together, unite the Muslims against the extremists. So that's basically my, my story in a nutshell. Which is a, a wonderful story to hear. And the more we go deeper into this conversation, the more I understand your reaction to what we might call, uh, in a nutshell, the Red-Green Alliance and how you're so opposed to it. The idea of secular Westerners who don't believe in any religious form at all, uh, um, shaking hands with people um, who claim to support the Palestinians, whatever that construct is. One of those organizations is Amnesty International, once a respected international NGO, but they seem to be utterly consumed with stunts, just stunts in this Instagram era which act against the state of Israel. Their recent apartheid reporter, a long slur, a long libel, putting up signs on roads and on bus shelters here with Israel is a racist endeavor or apartheid avenue on the street where the Israeli embassy is here in London, which incidentally is also the place where the Russian embassy is. They've got something going on as well at the moment. Their obsession destroying them and yet they double down, promising more of this. And people still give money to Amnesty International, despite the damage they are causing to the world. I mean, Amnesty International is not a serious organization. Uh, you read the uh, uh, abuse stories coming out of Amnesty uh, and uh, the directors and uh, the, the level of scandals that goes on there, uh, it'll show you that if they were serious, they would have solved the abuse uh, within their uh, venues uh, before pointing the finger at other places. Uh, I believe that uh, they operate on money, uh, much like the Human Rights uh, Watch organization and the, the fact that he had to return, how much was it? Kenneth Roth had to return uh, almost half a million dollars in, in donations uh, because they were classified as gifts. Uh, all of these people, they have no real credibility. And I'll tell you what, uh, they don't really have an impact in the real world. Yeah, they make a lot of noise. Uh, guess what else makes a lot of noise? A drum, an empty drum, makes a lot of noise. They make a lot of noise too. You look at the Amnesty uh, crew, who are they? Young men and women who are passionate uh, hormones and you know a guy who, Fell in, a white guy who fell in love with a Palestinian girl. Now, all of a sudden, he's donning the uh, Hamas scarf and, uh, yeah, let's free your country. They have no roots. They, couldn't, they don't even understand anything about the region. When you speak to them about, let's say, uh, indigeneity of the Jews, they won't know where to begin. Uh, and that's why they don't really debate uh, Arab Muslims who are living in Israel. 
you know, why don't they debate them? If it's an apartheid state, I'll give you uh, 50. I'll give you names of 50 Muslims, Arab-speaking Israelis, uh, who you can go and interview. Why don't they bring them up? They won't, because they can't hold the conversation. Amnesty is an organization of weak-minded individuals sitting behind computers, right, with good graphic design, right? And they come and they tell you there's an apartheid in this part of the world. Yeah. But this is the thing. Why are you talking to me now in 2022? Where were you in 1979, right? Where were you, right? I'm not, not just amnesty. I'm talking this entire, this entire group of people, this in, in the people who drive this narrative. Now amnesty, where's your report about the Iranian regime? And it's apartheid against Jews. It's apartheid against Christians. It's apartheid against the Baha'i Muslims, right? Where is your report? I don't see it. How, how strong do they criticize China about what, what it's doing to the Uyghur Muslims? I don't see you having permanent banners on your social media accounts, right? I don't see this much effort being put to discredit the Chinese regime. Right? At the end of the day, we're not people who were born yesterday. When we see that it's one-sided, the Arabs call the camel the uh, Ark of the Desert because it knows its way and it can sense danger and it can also uh, protect its passenger who's riding it from danger at night. Uh, it can divert its way if it feels there's danger ahead. And it also doesn't need much resources because it stores. However, when a camel has one eye, right, it will go, start swerving left and right, right? We need human rights organizations the same way we need camels in the desert. Okay. But when a human rights organization has only one eye, it's going to end up where? Going backwards then forwards. Now, here's the thing. They are preaching to a group of people who hate Jews. And because these people already hate Jews, they dislike Jews, they take what amnesty gives them as a fact, as a fact. And this here is the problem. But you know what? They don't operate without criticism. They get criticized a lot. And the many uh, India banned amnesty. <laughs> Imagine the largest democracy in the world gave amnesty the boot because of their lies and the trouble they create. Which is uh, positive news. Um, as you mentioned, an empty vessel makes a lot of noise. However, this, shall we say, luxury Palestinianism, this idea of being able to throw around comments on Twitter, say whatever you like, does cause real issues for Jewish people. And we saw it during the Gaza war. We saw celebrities with lots of Twitter followers, people who should know better. I was blocked by a very famous sports reporter, a former England international, I'm going to say his name, Gary Lineker, because I said to him with his millions of followers that he had a duty to the stability of our society and to stop talking about the Israeli defense against Gazan rockets. Because as we saw those four guys from Blackburn with a megaphone going down Finchley Road in London saying the worst possible things about defiling Jewish girls while Jewish people are upstairs listening to this and hiding. This has a real effect on the freedom of people to navigate free Western streets. This luxury Palestinianism is tangibly dangerous for people. I'm going to say something, but... Uh... It's something that uh, I said once before only. The Palestinians should really thank God that their conflict is with Israel. If they were to fire a single rocket at the UAE or Saudi Arabia, there would be no Gaza the next day. I promise you that. If, if they were to fire a single rocket at Saudi Arabia, because here's the thing, there is no entity to balance against. You know, superpowers, they balance against each other. When Iran fires a rocket, then they go into strategy and balancing. But when the Hamas does it, I mean, who are they? They'll be gone like this. 
The very fact that Israel has to phone a building's owner and tells him to empty the building so they can strike. Saudi Arabia would never do this. The UAE would never do this. They should really be grateful for the fact that they are dealing with a country that follows the law and follows human rights and understands how to minimize civilian injuries and so on. The world is not blind, really. We don't need to be convincing anyone that firing 4,500 rockets onto a Jewish state and hundreds of those rockets falling into Gaza itself, killing Palestinians is wrong. We don't need to do that. Those who want to see the truth and want to side with the truth will see it and side with it. Those who want to live a blind life are the test for the rest of humanity. We have to somehow strengthen our ties and pass this test. They are wealthy, they have resources, they create problems, obstacles. You and I as Muslims and Jews, we need to strengthen our alliance so that these extremists continue to fail in what they were doing, whether they're Muslim, whether they're just uh, you know, people who are sympathetic with terrorists, they will fail. Terrorism always fails. They never win at the end, in my opinion. Imam, it's been a wonderful conversation. I have learned a great deal about the logic, the spiritual ideas, uh, and I'm going to leave you with one final question. It's a light one because I think we've earned this together. It was Purim recently, and I did laugh when someone called Moshe wrote to you asking if you'd be offended if he dressed up as you to celebrate the festival. (laughs) Not not only did you say yes, but you said, yeah, send me some pictures. Has Moshe sent you any pictures? I'm I'm waiting for them. So if he does, I'll retweet it. (laughs) Definitely let's well. let's get Moshe on the case. I think he was probably shocked the idea that not only did you laugh at it, but you granted him the permission. Yeah, why not? Yeah. Of course. You would not be offended. Well, when Purim comes round uh, again, uh, Imam, I will consider growing a big black beard in preparation. Um, it has been uh, an immense pleasure to talk to you today. Thank That's you right. so much for reaching out to me. I am so grateful as our audience will be here on Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Thank you very much. God bless you, my brother. Thank you very much for having me. And I look forward to connecting with you in the future. May God bless you all. Thank you. God willing, God willing. This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. North America, Europe, the Commonwealth, the whole of the Middle East. The world is listening.